Live on BBC One now, The Vanessa Show. It's Friday the 16th of April, it's 10 past 10, and this is The Vanessa Show. On today's programme, child abduction. Up to a thousand British children a year are snatched by one of their parents. We expose the trauma for tug-of-love families. Also coming up, it's the Queen's favourite sitcom. It's last of the summer wine, and today we meet its stars. Socks with sandals, baggy trousers and saggy vests. Why are British men still stuck in style hell? And Tamara Beckwith will be here with the ultimate in chic bags for summer. All this plus this week's winner of our Star is Born competition. Well, it's estimated that up to a thousand British children a year are snatched away by one of their parents. And today, experts from all over the world are gathering in London to discuss the growing problem of parental child abduction. So what can be done to help tug-of-love children? Here to discuss this are author Jacqueline Pascal Gillespie, lawyer and chairwoman of Reunite, Anne-Marie Hutchinson, and tug-of-love mother Dawn Mainston. You've written a most moving book about, about your own experiences. Do, do tell us what happened to you. I mean, it all started so romantically <laughs> when you were wooed and won by a Malaysian prince. Sounds like a fairy story. It does, rather, but I want to tell you now that if a prince comes knocking on your door, lock the door, hide under the bed and call the police. Don't open the door. It's a, not a good way to go. But he wooed you with tremendous kind of vigour and tremendous splendid largesse, didn't he? He did, and at 17, that was how old I was when I married him, it was very heady, but very romantic. But more than anything, I wanted to build a family, and I thought that was the way to go, more than the royal element of it. Um, and we had quite a, a brutal marriage. Um, for five years and then he sent me home to Australia and I lived there with my two children. I had a two-month-old baby and a two-year-old. Now we've got pictures of the children. And, uh, little boy is Eden. That's and right. And little girl is Shah and we can see pictures of now. I mean two gorgeous children. So yeah. there you were living in Australia with your children and then what happened? And I'd settled. I, I was uh, on television actually reading the news and doing other things like that and I allowed him to see the children as often as possible because I thought that that was very important but he only came maybe once a year for two or three days and after seven years, uh, he turned up for a visit and I thought I was being conciliatory, allowed him a lot of freedom. I'd always had this fear in the back of my mind and he, he kidnapped the children. They went on a, you know, a, a 9,000 mile journey through rugged terrain and out through uh, on, a on a boat between Australia and Malaysia. And that's the last I've ever heard of them. I haven't seen or spoken to my children or received even a photograph or a telephone call since the 9th of July 1992. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. It's been a long time. It's a terrible thing, an absolutely terrible thing. Now, there they were in Malaysia, in the bosom of the royal family. That's what, right. What could you possibly do? What did you try to do at the beginning? Everything. Absolutely everything. I'm sure, Vanessa, if something happened to you like that, you would do anything you could Absolutely. with the media. You'd do cartwheels to try and get your children back. Anything, yes. And that's what I did. It caused a huge diplomatic storm because Australia was negotiating a new trade agreement with Malaysia at the time, and my kids are right in the middle of it. And, of course, head to head with the royal family, no one wanted to disturb this, the, this horrible situation that had occurred. And it, 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 I think, really, it changed... It caused a change of government in Australia because of the lack of support. It was a huge groundswell and it was, it was front page news for eight months, which I mean, was quite hideous. I mean, did you, for hideous. example, feel like going there yourself and snatching them back again? Oh, well, Vanessa, I'd love to go there. I, I can't go. He won't... I can't get into the country without being arrested. So it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. Um, once a royal family locks down, the royal family keeps very tight. So I had to look at a different way of going about things. I, I, it was either slash my wrist crawl into a corner, become a victim, or make a choice to survive this, and turn it around. So I started making documentary films on the issue and gradually started helping other parents. Um, how old are your children now? Well, they were taken when they were seven and nine, and now my son is 16 and my daughter's almost 14. You've sent them endless letters, packages, photographs. As far as you're concerned, they probably haven't got any of them, do you think? I really, I really doubt if they have received anything. I've written so many times, constantly, and I send presents, I send them through various ways, nefarious and openly, and still I'm allowed no contact. What, what do you think the future might hold, if you could even bear to think about that? The best... Look, I live every day 
at a time. Uh, I'm, I keep myself enormously busy. If I see my children before they're 21, it'll be an enormous bonus. And until then, I, I just live in hope and hope that part of them keeps intact. Because when children are abducted, the terrible thing is one parent will pit the children against the other. And children deserve both parents, no matter what circumstance they're in. And one thing that's really important to understand is child abduction, men do it and women do it. And that's still equally as damaging to the children. So if I can see my kids when they're adults, I'll be happy and I hope they remember who I am. So or you're hoping curious. that at the age of 21, when they have some freedom, they might make a, a journey to find you and to see yes. you. Yes. I, I certainly hope so too. Thank you. If that, thanks so much for that story, which must be dreadfully painful for you to tell. I mean, it really must. Now, let me bring in Anne-Marie here because you're a lawyer and you're really at the centre of all of this. Yes. You, you work for Reunite. Explain what that is and, and well, what Reunite you do. is a charity. I'm chair of that on a voluntary basis, which assists parents, both parents who abduct and who are left behind parents and grandparents in the field of child abduction. I'm surprised to hear you say assists parents who abduct. Well, it's a very complex issue, child abduction, and if Reunite can persuade a parent through support to return children, then that is what we do. And closing them out doesn't solve any problems, so we try and bring them in and convince them that the best thing to do is to return the children. Now, th th there out. is a treaty by which countries agree that if there is an abducted child brought to their country, they will do their level best to make sure that the child is returned. What's the name of that? That's right. That's the Hague Convention on right. International Child Abduction. And there are 56 countries that are members. But, for example, Malaysia is not. Most of the Middle Eastern states are not, and most of um, the Central Asian states are not. Lady here. Jacqueline, my heart goes out to you. I actually read your article in the paper yeah. coming up to the show today. It mentioned you were with a partner when the children were kidnapped. Are you still with him? <laughs> Look, this just is... Just the support side of it, if somebody's actually yeah. there it's, in your it's background. It's so important to have support around mm. one. It's so important. But also, it's, it's a hugely pressurised area to be in, obviously. Right. And I, I suppose I channel most of my energies. I'm, I, I run an, an, the counterpart of Reunite's organisation. Right. I run in the Empty Arms in Australia. I keep very busy and I'm also a humanitarian aid ambassador for Australia. Oh, you've done brilliantly. So. I think anybody in the audience and at home would say the same thing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Amory, so there are 56 countries which are part of the, of the, the convention. convention. So countries like Malaysia, Morocco, big parts of the Middle East, Africa mm. that are not members. That's what, right. What can you do there? Well, that is the pro once a child is taken to one of those states, it's virtually impossible to have the child returned other than on a voluntary basis. And what the left behind parent would have to do is start proceedings in that country, and they may not speak the language, they may. You know, money is a huge problem finding a lawyer, and then because they're not part of the convention, there is usually a reason for that and there is a prejudice, an inbuilt prejudice against them in the foreign court. All right, well, this story isn't altogether and always bleak because Dawn is here, Dawn Mainston, and she is one of the people who was helped hugely by Reunite. Tell me about what happened to you. It also started promisingly. He wasn't a prince, but you thought he was your prince at the beginning. Where was he from? Spain. And you fell in love and you went off to Spain to live with him? Yeah, I lived there for eight years. And then what happened? I had three children, there was problems within the marriage, so I came back to England, I had custody, he had access, he took them to Spain for five weeks and then just him and said he wasn't going to bring them home again. You, you talked very movingly before the show about this, you, you said you had painted your children's bedrooms ready to welcome them when they came home. Yeah, because we'd just been given a new house so I wanted it all really nice for when they did arrive home again after the five weeks. You went to the airport to meet them, although he'd said, I'm not bringing them back, you just couldn't believe he would do something that cruel. No, I didn't believe it the whole 11 months they weren't there, that he, wouldn't, he would always bring them back to me and he just didn't. So what did you do to make sure that he did? Because this story does have a happy ending. After 11 months, you did get your children back. Yeah, I was able to take it to court in Spain. Speaking the language was a great help. And I did actually win the case and the children were allowed to come home to me. Well done. <laughs> May I ask them, when they actually came back, when you got them back, I mean, we hear a lot and we read a lot about children who have been abducted. Essentially, in order to survive, trying to sort of cut out the absent parent and somehow trying to kind of adapt to the new life. Um, did you find them very much changed in the 11 months? Not so much they've changed, their whole attitude of life has changed. I mean, their schoolwork has suffered terribly. They're very, I'm very protected towards them, 
I'm always looking over my back in case he comes back to take them away again because, yes, he is their father and, yes, he does deserve a right to see them, but if he does it again, I don't know how that would affect them. You said the first night you got them back, you all huddled in the same bed together, all four of you. Yeah, we all slept together. I bet you just couldn't bear to let them out of your sight oh, even definitely for a not. second. And, and Amory, this was achieved because Spain is part. Is a, is a member of the Hague Convention, yes. although um, each country implements it separately and it took a long time for Dawn's children to come home. Um, which is something we're trying to rectify to reunite. I mean, what we what we read in the papers is very often that the sort of the, the host country is particularly sympathetic to their own. Well, know, that's right, and that does member, happen. And, and therefore, they, you know, they might say, well, you know, Dawn as a British mother was a sort of unfit mother, and this was a fine, upstanding Spanish father, and you know that kind of thing. Like, do you mm. find that there's a great deal of prejudice? Well, in the, the whole idea of the convention is to get rid of that prejudice and stop what lawyers call forum shopping in effect, going to a country where you think you'll get a better deal. Yes. Question here for Anna-Marie. Um, would you put this down to the fact of the matter is that because the courts, the way they look at men when they try and get custody of children, is this, does this, would you, from your idea, would you, would you reckon that this is why so much abduction has been taking place throughout the world, it's not just in the know. UK, but because of the restrictions, because of the way judges look on men when they try to get custody of their own kids? No, I don't. I, most abductions have a cross-cultural or an international background. The parties come from different countries and different cultures. So you know, most, 99% of abductions come from cross-cultural marriages. But a very small percentage come from what, you know, the, the vindictive take, snatching of children. Right. Just a final word from Jacqueline, just in case by any strange quirk of fate this BBC show gets beamed into Malaysia and stranger things have happened. It's true. You know, they really have. Just in case anybody who knows you or knows your children is watching, what would you say? Remember that I love you and I don't want to keep fighting. That's over and done with. Just allow my children to know both parents because all children in the world deserve to have both parents so they have an idea about who they are themselves. Thank you very much indeed all of you for coming in. Friday is World Book Day and don't forget it also sees the launch of our very own book club. Each month I'll be recommending a book that I've really enjoyed or found especially gripping and I really hope that you're going to love it too. It could be a classic, a bestseller, a how-to book or even a cookery book but whatever it is I promise it really will be a good read and one that I can recommend personally. Then we'll chat about it live on the programme with the author. Now my first book is Other People's Children by Joanna Trollope. I think it's a really moving and sensitive story about the trials, tribulations and the triumphs of being step parents and step children. If you want to get involved, all you've got to do is get hold of a copy. This is what it looks like. It's called Other People's Children and read it. You've only got a week left, so get your skates on. Then next week, Joanna Trollope will be here and you can be here too. If you've read the book and loved it, or even if you hated it and you want to say why, give us a call on 0990 100 722 and you can be part of our studio audience and talk directly to that best selling author. Even if you're not a regular reader, why not make an exception? I promise you, you'll love it. That and number again, if you want more details about the Vanessa Book Club, it's 0990 100 722. And this month's book is Other People's Children by Joanna Trollope. So go on, get reading. You may just find you love it. Now, it's the world's longest-running TV sitcom. It's 27 years old, and the new series begins on Sunday night. Take a look at this. <laughs> I once arrested an interior decorator. I remember he refused to give a statement until we'd found him some lavender notepaper. <laughs> hey, Elf. That's Lucy. <laughs> I think he's gonna jump. Into six inches of water. <laughs> I think he needs help. He certainly does if he's jumping into six inches of water. <laughs> We're gonna have to help him find somewhere deeper. Hey, Elf Lucy! <laughs> That was a big help. <laughs> Please welcome from Last of the Summer Wine, Peter Salis and Frank Thornton. <laughs> Hello there. Thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to meet you. Please yeah. sit down. How do you do? Thank you so much for coming. Do sit down. Have you, you seen animal? Ooh. Have you seen animal crackers? What do you mean? Well, the, the show, the, where is it, the Globe? Yeah, um, something like that. No, the lyric. Well, it's very near the Globe, anyway. 
No, the Animal Crack. We were just talking about it. Oh, well, were you? Should well, I that's an old show. That's been running more than 27 years. Did you think when you, when you got the job that it was going to be such a long gig, this one? Yes. You thought it was going to catch on immediately? Yep. In fact, I'm surprised it's taken so long. <laughs> one of the things is amazing is that the, the, the village where you film it has completely been transformed by you and the show. Yes. Tell us what it was like at the beginning. Dead. Moribund. You couldn't get... You couldn't get a meal. There, there were hundreds of pubs, but there was nowhere to eat. And uh, it was really the quietest, deadest place since Tombstone. And now? Well, it's full of wine bars, and uh, it's got a four-star hotel <laughs> and uh, restaurants, yes. There's a long-running discussion about how the locals think about it, because they can't park. For instance, yes. <laughs> do you all feel the responsible tourists, all the for this? tourist buses coming around watching us filming. Do you feel responsible for this? This desecration of I rural don't feel England? worried about it. No. I must admit, you know, I mean, it doesn't keep me awake at nights. But but there's no doubt that yes, Roy Clark is um, BBC are responsible. Yes, they for have it. to take it on the chin, really, for that. So you're a new recruit, really. I'm the new boy. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, we remember you from Grace Brothers, but there you are bobbing up in Yorkshire. Yes, I should be so lucky. Yeah. When you got the call, it took you ten seconds to decide, yes, I'll pack my bag and go to Yorkshire? No, quicker than that. Even quicker? Quicker than that, yes. As I've been a fan of the show for a long time. I, I, I love the show. And I always wanted, I always hoped that one day I would be offered one episode, you see. So um, when Roy said that he'd like me to do the whole series, you know, I was... It was wonderful. And I hear that it's very much boys and girls on the show, that the gentlemen eat together in the evenings and the ladies eat together at a separate table. Is this true? Uh, yes. <laughs> Why? Uh, why? Because we'd like to keep apart. Why? <laughs> why? Well, look, if Thora Heard wants to say anything to me, I'm there for eight hours of the day. When I get back to the hotel, I want to read my book, and I don't mind talking to him, but I don't want to talk to Thora for another two hours, especially as she's had nothing to say to me in the previous eight. <laughs> I thought this was just a joke. I didn't realize Don't believe got... a word I of do it. believe it, though. I oh, do. I believe it, All yes. boys together and all girls together. The only conversation I've ever had with Thora Heard is, how are you, Thora, but I'm not going to ask you that in case you tell me. <laughs> I, I hope she's not watching. She won't be devastated to hear this. Yes, she will. Oh. Yes, she'll be devastated. All right, there's a question for you at the red up. mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's more of a comment, actually, Vanessa. I'd just like to say thank you very much, gentlemen, for the last 27 years of uh, Last of the Summer Wine. It's uh, absolutely first class television, and here's to the next 27. It's not thank bad, you very is it? Much. That's not bad. Are you. Do you, you, really we'll, you really think we'll be here for another 27 <laughs> years? <laughs> Are you up for it? If, if the Almighty spares you, would you still be sticking around Holmfoot for another 27? I would, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, what, mm. Who else will have us? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it true that these days you're using stunt doubles? We always have. Oh, really? They said that it was only a recent thing. No. Oh, uh, no. No, no but that's not... I mean, what is unusual about using stunt doubles? Films always do use stunt doubles. They can't risk the stars falling over a wall and getting hurt. No, so who so was that, that bridge in that clip we saw? That was an unknown stunt double, was it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's nothing unusual about this. It isn't because we're silly old gentlemen who can't walk. You know, um, if, if, for instance, you've got to have three people walking across a hill, they've got to get there. Now, the, the, the principals of the, of the show can be away in the studio doing something else with the dialogue. So they save time by putting three doubles up on the hill. There's nothing <laughs> unusual about that. Well, they could be asleep, which is much more likely. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> we had, uh, Saving Carla, our energies. We had Carla Lane on the show yesterday. You know Carla Lane, who wrote The Land yes, of Birds and yes. Butterflies. And she was actually lamenting the fact that the sitcom these days, she says, the newfangled sitcom, has become incredibly, she says, obvious. She says there are no more secrets and there's far too much sex. Would you agree with that? Is that the secret of Last of the Summer Wine, that it's rather subtle? Well, there's certainly no sex in it. I mean, we couldn't manage it. <laughs> Is that, would you concur with it's your colleague? It's a matter there? of opinion, of course. I thought so. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, I think basically he's right, yes. Mm. No, there's no, there's no sex, no. And it's about as exciting as the weather programme, actually. But, um, you know, it, 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 
it gets by. It obviously just touches the spot, something very yes, reassuring it's about it. It's very, very clever, Roy. About it. Very, very, clever very good. Indeed. And if any, anybody doesn't realise this, every single episode has been written by the same gentleman, which is mm. absolutely extraordinary. Well, mm. that's the secret of it. The yeah. secret of, of the success of this is Roy Clark, because he writes the most extraordinary, um, extraordinary dialogue and situation. Nobody else could write this show. No, could possibly even attempt no. it. Absolutely I mean, not. like the American sitcoms, which are written by committees, you see. Yeah. A committee couldn't write this show. It has to be Roy Clark. Now, we've talked about the absence of sex in Last of the Summer, but it's not all true, because it isn't all flat caps and wellies. Our next guest is famous for adding her own touch of glamour to the Yorkshire Moors. Do take <laughs> a look at this. Riding simulator. Does it exercise the thighs? I should have thought yours had enough exercise, <laughs> given all the time you spent cycling. I can't tell you how relieved I am that you specified cycling. <laughs> Please welcome Yorkshire's answer to Marilyn Monroe, Marina, otherwise known as actress Jean Ferguson. <laughs> Sit down. It is lovely to meet you. Well, it's lovely to be here. I mean, you really are an extraordinary character. May I also say that um, earlier on when we were talking about the Marilyn Monroe, Peter said more like Dolly Parton, didn't you? Well, that's not bad, is I it? I suppose, actually, it's probably better. It's better describing the character. And such a keen cyclist. Oh, yes. Mind you, when Frank was saying earlier on about the stunts, a number of times I've had to fall off a bicycle. Are you a good bicycle a faller Not really, no. No. Now, in fact, when Robert Fife and I were first asked to do the series and then suddenly there we are on the bicycles, we, we, we had not been asked whether we could ride bicycles, but luckily we can. And Robert Fife, of course, is the lovely Howard. Yes. Who is, who is w willing or unwilling? He's sort of both willing and, willing and incapable? Willing well, he's and a wimp, really, isn't I he? Can, I, uh, Alan Bell has a penchant for this sort of thing because he engaged a lady who was going to be driving a motor car and finishing up by dancing, you know, sort of a come dancing sequence. When he got on the floor, he discovered that she couldn't ride, a, uh, she couldn't dance, and she couldn't drive a car. Um, so this sort of thing is quite common, you know. That's, that's television producers for you. Absolutely, yeah. here, here. Now you you started off in the stage version of Last of the Summer. Little did you know that this was going to become your life. Well, I'd been a fan of the show, like Frank. I'd been a great fan of the show, and suddenly I was asked to go up for what was described as a young Phyllis Diller or something um, in the stage version, and I had no idea. That, that it was going to be full of the stars of Summer Wine as well, but I suppose I should have realised that. And I get down to the rehearsals and there's Peter and Bill and I was just absolutely overawed. And suddenly there I am in the stage version and we Terrible little... play, though, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the worst play <laughs> that I've... Uh, well, I've been associated with two or three really awful plays, but this one... <laughs> I mean, we prayed every night that something would go wrong, that some, a chair would break or something. We had a sofa bed, which we were supposed to get into and pull it up over us. Well, we couldn't even get it open, so we used to get the <laughs> stage management on uh, to come and open the bed for us. So those were the sort of high spots that kept the play <laughs> running. I want to talk about high spots, funnily enough, because I want to share with the audience a very important detail of the show, which is something to do with your bra. Do tell. Ah. Well, as and they are high points. Let's as face everybody it. will probably understand, there's not many places on Marina's body when she's got her costume on that when the winds are howling and the snow is snowing up there on the top of the hills, that you can put thermals to keep warm. And we discovered that these things, they're like little packets of um, something that you, you, you warm up. They're hand warmers or something you put in your pocket normally. Well, I had no pockets. So we put them in my bra. And it actually helps for Marina's figure as well. But it is amazing, I have to say, how wonderful these little warmers are. I'm seeing down your you bra. through new eyes. Well, so am I. <laughs> Next time we watch, we'll when, be thinking of that. That expression on your face is the heated oh. pads in your bra. Yes. And I don't want anybody coming up to me and saying, can I, um, you know, warm yeah. my hands about your person? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not such a bad idea. Listen, it's been wonderful to meet you. The new series starts this week. Thank you so much for coming in, all of you. Thank you very Thank much. You for Thank you. Thank you. Really lovely. Thank you. Why of 
British men still stuck in style hell. And tomorrow, Beckwith will be here with a pick of the crop of summer handbags. But first, it's time to find the winner of this week's Star is Born competition. The votes have been coming in all week, so let's find out who's going to climb the first step to stardom and go through to our monthly final. Will it be Monday's Steve Quinn from Grangemouth in Scotland? Or Tuesday's Sandy Sandiford from Manchester? Will it be Wednesday's Josie Watkins from Southampton? Or will it be Thursday's Julie Wells from Bristol? Now, let me give this to you, Jean. Here we go. And the winner is... Julie Wells. Julie Wells. Come on, Julie. Julie, she was, only, she was only on the show yesterday. Oh. Trounced everybody else this week. And you're a new mum. I am, yes, to Jodie. Yes, yes, and uh, this has been a bit of a revelation, hasn't it? Um, just a bit, yeah. Tell me about the phone calls that flooded in yesterday. Oh, the phone was busy non-stop. It was amazing. What did your mum and dad think? Very proud, I think. Very yeah. proud. So mm -hmm. you're back again today with another song. Yes, that's right. You're yep. going to do a Lisa Stansfield number. All around the world. You look a bit like her, of course. Do people always say that? Um, a few. Doesn't she? It. She does. You do look a bit like her. Are you nervous or are you getting getting the hang now, getting into the swing? Petrified. <laughs> still petrified. <laughs> Any tips? Uh, no, it Breathe never deep. goes away. Yes, breathe deeply. <laughs> breathe deeply. Yes, start that now. Right. And maybe a heated pad's in the bra. Oh, maybe that <laughs> 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 To warm the cockles. Listen, you're going to be great. Thank you very Thanks much very indeed. Much. Lovely to see you. Thank you Thank to you. all of you. And Julie Wells, everybody. <laughs> This man is known throughout the world for his socks and sandals fashion faux pas. Sagging trousers, egg spattered ties, anoraks and all. Even when they try really hard to get it right, like Jonathan Ross, oh my goodness, Jeremy Clarkson, please, William Hague, oh, give us a break, and even Ewan McGregor, and we can actually do a close-up on those short little hairy legs, look at those, ah. Oh. The poor dears still do seem to get it very wrong indeed, but this isn't really as bad as all that. Please welcome Giovanni Giordano, Italian fashion expert, and William Drew, editor of FW Magazine. <laughs> Are you going to be tough with us? What do you think of British men and their fashion sense? Well, Vanessa, I um, do uh, think that um, British men, the average British man, um, is a boring dresser, lack um, imagination. Come on, audience, react to this. And and Ooh, and, yes. and, and, and um, you know confidence, and um, has unfortunately not style. No style. No. Really? But yes. we think we're so beautifully put together. Well, perhaps it doesn't give enough time or um, attention to, um, to detail. Uh, that's, that's really what, what is missing, I think. William, are you going uh, to let him get away with this? No, I think that, that he's giving uh, British men an, an unfair time. I think they're getting much better. They're, it's a slow process, but they're beginning to think about what they're wearing much more. They're getting, beginning to spend uh, a bit more money. And they're even beginning to talk um, you know, with their peers about, about fashion and discuss fashion, which is something quite new for British men. I mean, would you like to see, William, British men dressing like Italian men? Is it suitable for the British temperament? Well, the, the British can learn a little from the Italians. Um, the Italians are, are uh, smarter and they're more, they're more stylish in some ways. But what they don't have is, is a huge amount of imagina imagination. The Italians are very classic and uh, very conservative in their dressing. Do you and hear they that? Also... Italians are dull and conservative. Do we have any Italians in the audience by any chance? Raise your hand, Italians. A whole lot of them. <laughs> is it true? Is it true that you're a bit that your men dress in a very dull, conservative, predictable way? Yeah. Oh yeah. You prefer for the look of British men. Yeah. Oh really? Oh well, that's nice. An Italian capitulates there. Giovanni, do you accept that that Italian men really dress more like a uniform? Well, not really. No, I don't think so. Um, I think we we sort of uh, well, um, you know, we have a different sort of um, way of um, you know, we look smarter. Um, perhaps it's more classic, yes, but uh, um, what, what in England is considered as sort of a street fashion, yeah. we perhaps consider it as a, you know, being scruffy. So looking uh, at William sitting up there next to you, have a look at William Giovanni. What do you think of the way he's put together today? This is, is um, well, it's, um, you know, it looks pretty good to me. Yes. Pretty good. Marks out of ten for William's own style? Uh, um, well, ten. Eight. <laughs> eight. What don't you like? I bet it's the open neck. 
No, 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 no. That's that's pretty good for that. Um, what, do, what does he lack? Well, I don't know. Perhaps a tie. Hasn't got a shiny tie like yours. <laughs> I thought that was it. What do you think of Giovanni's look, William? He, he looks very smart, but it's it's a very classic Italian look, and he's a it's a grey suit with you know a, a, a tone on tone tie and shirt, and um, you know I think I think the the Italians can learn a little from the British street style yeah, and the British imagination. Up a bit. All yeah. right, now let we let's just do a little experiment. Would our gentlemen in the audience please stand? All gentlemen, thank you very much. Right. Now, Giovanni. Yes. Have a look at these gentlemen. We've got a nice array of them. We've got all manner of dresses in the audience. Which do you think is the worst dressed man here? Well, if I may say, Vanessa, uh, yeah. uh, probably the gentleman on the uh, left hand side, at the very corner with the uh, check shirt. Oh, you R don't like the look of his lumberjack shirt? No. Come I'm on afraid. down, so come and come and join me here, my love. <laughs> And uh, tell me, tell me, uh, William, which do you think is the best dressed man? I want a man who really is a credit to British dressers. Well, I think maybe the chap in the front row on the end here. Well, this uh, chap looks, in the jumper look, with the cord? Yeah, he looks OK, come, looks and, come and join smooth. me, sir. OK, up on the stage, everybody, both gentlemen with me here. Thank you. OK, well, let's have a look, Giovanni, at your worst dressed man. What's your name, sir? Uh, Richard. Are you mortally offended by this? No, not at all. Do you, are you proud to be considered the worst dressed man in the audience? Don't have an issue about it, no. You don't have an issue? Did no. you think carefully about this look when you put it together this morning? Mm, not really. OK, what was your criterion, actually, for teaming this charming red lumberjack shirt with these... What are they? Chinos? Jeans? <laughs> Chinos. Chinos in a sort of mustard yellow plus the green number underneath. What were you actually thinking? What was going through your head? Uh, I thought it might snow, so I thought I'd better dress up to the weather. Are you got, have you got a vest on underneath there? No. OK, what was wrong with this look? Well, Stop moving it's backwards. Uh... Stand still, old <laughs> gentleman. What do you think? It's, um, well, a combination of um, three, four different colours. Yes. Um, what colour red, socks are you wearing? Well, red... With a little... With with black with a little tooth. red sort of flower on the side. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's just not the way we probably, um, you know, put our, um, you know, sort of colours together. Um, and that's probably, uh, well, it's no shirt on top of another shirt and it, it, it just doesn't go. Doesn't go. No. What do you think, William? Is this, is this a classic no. example of casual British manhood? No, it's not. <laughs> I think this, this is maybe the old British man rather than the new British man and I can't really defend that look. You I'm can't sure. even defend the look. Audience, what do we think of the way this guy looks? Any good hands up? You think he looks fabulous just the way he is? No, it's a big thumbs down for your look. <laughs> oh I'm really sorry about that. But William, you have singled out this gentleman. What's your name, sir? Tej. Tej, as, as a, your example of, of a really good British style of dress. Yeah, Why is that? Well, he's not. He's not bad. It's um, he's got the, the kind of street style combats, but in a cord fabric, which makes him a little more interesting and updated. Some nice kind of oxblood coloured uh, boots and a, a roll neck jumper. It's quite casual. The, the jumper maybe needs to be a little more fitted, but um, it's, it's quite a casual, clean look. Um, uh, I think he, he looks all right. He's smiling. He's looking quite happy with himself. <laughs> what were you thinking this morning when you put this look together? Uh, absolutely nothing. I just uh, grabbed the first thing I could see on the... Really? Couch. Yeah, absolutely. Do you consider yourself a bit of a natty dresser, though? Uh, I consider myself a pretty good dresser at times. Right. Um, at times, I can look like that as well. Well, so. don't admit that on television. <laughs> Nobody had to know that. So tell me, what do you think of this look? You see, William thinks this is fabulous. No, I actually agree with William. I mean, it, it, it does look better than the other gentleman. Um, it has got some, some, you know, some style to it. Um, and as, 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 you know, as he, as he pointed out, uh, you see, the, uh, you know, they, you know, British, you know, the average British men don't think about, uh, you know, what's where. They just throw things well, on. Well, is it that they seriously they do think, but they don't want to admit that they no, think about it? No, yes. They we, just we, want to pretend that they think European, that they don't. You know, European men probably take a little, you know, m well, you know, more time to, uh, to, you know, think of what, you know, what's where. All right, and, now, having uh, thoroughly humiliated you, you're allowed to come and sit down. <laughs> but I do just want to draw attention to a couple of men in the audience, who whose looks have not escaped me. Let me just not singling anybody out. But look at this gentleman here. Do stand up. So look at this. Charmingly turned out, gentlemen. What's your name, sir? Des McDermott. You see, Des McDermott. Look at this look there. What do you think of that, Giovanni? Nice. Um, yes. I mean, you know, coordinated, and uh, it looks it looks good. Yes. Would you say you're a serious dresser? You think a lot about fashion? Uh, yeah. You absolutely. look good today. Thank you very much. And I, I, I couldn't resist talking to this gentleman here. Of course, do stand up. Well, what is your name? Uh, it's Mark. It's Mark. I mean, look at Mark. 
looks blooming marvellous. So can you stick your feet out, Mark, so we can see your shoes? I don't know if the camera can get this. Look at Mark's shoes. Describe those boots. Um, oh, <laughs> cheating. They give me a bit more height. And what about this? Is what, PVC? Yes, it is. Go on, I'm, I'm turning on. I'm really big aroused. <laughs> PVC, and what's, this is like a, like a, so, a lycra. So a lycra thing, PVC, big chunky boots, black lipstick and the jacket on the top. This is Rocky Horror in the morning. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think uh, uh, at least um, he's showing a little bit of imagination. He's expressing himself, so he's uh, you know, belying the fact that the British men um, you know, don't, don't have a, a sense of ima imagination. Or a fashion. sense of humour, whichever way you want to look at it. Giovanni, <laughs> no, I, does this I, do it for you? I agree with that. I mean, that's, that's individual. I mean, this is, he's individual. And it, it is obviously put together a thing that he likes, and I ab absolutely agree with that. OK, uh, lady um, over it, there, what do you think? Well, I'd like to stick up for the English men, Giovanni, being part Italian as well. You look, sure. Both of you look absolutely lovely. Both look great. My other half wears jeans in the daytime on a building site, but in the evening he only wears Armani, Boss, etc., etc. Wow. Can I ask your suit? Could you show us where it's made from, please? Do Mine? you have a label, your suit? Yes, it's Fendi. Oh. An advert. We didn't mean to do no, that. That was an accident. Where it's from, Italian or French? No, 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 it is Italian, yes. Yeah, Italian, I like yes. my husband in silk pyjamas, but that's just a personal <laughs> thing. All right, thank you very much indeed, Giovanni and thank William. You. Thank you. To. It's already spring, the new styles have been in the shops for weeks, but I am still toting my old winter handbag. It must be time to get some expert advice, so please welcome the super stylish girl about town, Tamara Beckwith. <laughs> There were some cores from the audience as you walked in, beautifully <laughs> dressed as ever. This is my old bag. I've been schlepping it round the whole winter. What do you think? I think it's time for change. Is it? Yes. Show me your bag. What do you carry around? Well, I bag? brought this one today. This is, cool. this is what is it made of? Mohair or something? Well, actually, you know, I'm a bit cheeky because my girlfriend who lives with me, she sometimes doesn't give me rent. She pays me in handbags that she <laughs> makes. Love so. bag ladies. Look with. Applique pansies and it's She's all called the bag lady. It's beautiful. Now, can you tell a lot about a woman by her bag? I think so. I think um, most girls like handbags and obviously the bigger the more stuff you tend to put in them. So I prefer really smaller ones, but I think yours, Daphne, is looking a bit... You know, what? it's quite 80s power woman. Oh, is it? I'm really dazed. <laughs> oh, I'm so humiliated, I could scream. Now, at but least you're not going to be ferreting through and looking at the contents of I this think bag, we or? are, though, just because I think you can tell an awful lot. You are kidding. what is in there. Before the show, I said, no way is she going to look in my handbag. And they said, no, no, it's fine, she's not. Well, no, no, we are. Just a little rummage. What do you reckon? We'll just... <laughs> it's not a good sign, guys. <laughs> Completely full We've of condoms got... and twixes. Not really. Oh, that's my daughter's! That's my daughter's! I'm not sure that that... What are those? It's not a pair of socks from Tesco. It's from my daughter. Vanessa, this is not... Any minute, she's going to pull out a frozen chicken. I guys, can't see my bag. This is a very, very oh, giveaway please. sign. We've got... A half-eaten trick. Oh, please. But, guys, that is, you know, that is quite a good sign because that means that you're a very reserved character. Yes, I didn't you eat didn't the whole, eat the whole lot. thing You've in one go. You've got to keep body and soul together, haven't you? What else have we got? Oh, Lipsticks, oh, nail Oh, can't we move varnishes. swiftly on to something else? Oh, please. Photographs of the family. Yeah, photographs of my family. What's yes. that? Pink hair. But that's quite a good accessory. Yeah. Family, look at it on holiday. We look very on sweet. holiday. Look, I didn't know you were going. Sorry, to do this. I would have put some really chic things in if I'd known. <laughs> Let's move to what we should be wearing. Ignore my rubbish. Well, what about what about that little bag pile in there? Well, this is my these are my this is my evening bag. They told so me these are the ones we're going to renegate. These are my to the new bags. summer summer yeah. stuff. Yeah, this is just some casual wear I brought in from I home. How embarrassing. Just a little, just a little. I'm being thoroughly humiliated. I'm sick I think of we should move wander over, over to <laughs> okay, let's move what's here. going to be. Let's have a look at what the celebs are actually carrying their stuff around in this year. Let's have a look at this picture. of This is Liz Hurley with a great big basket type thing. Well, look, that, that, basically there are going to be three new looks for the summer, I think. We've got minimum, minimal urban, which I'm not sure is really our thing. Mm. Then you're going to have kind of the baskets, sort of summer beach look and then you've got the kind of the little oh, weenie right. well, show beady us, show things. Show us the Liz Hurley look, one of those great big baskets. What, how, well, how, we don't really have an enormous one, but that's you. kind of the same. And I mean, you know, that's that's actually from Liberty. It's about 90 quid. So 90 quid for a that's basket. That's probably though. not such a bargain. But, you know, then, but then you've got this kind of little one, which is a warehouse. 
Yeah. And that's sort of 20. That's pretty nice. Oh, like that one. That's a nice one. Okay. And it's got look, little pink gingham inside. Oh, so that is rather sweet, that one. <laughs> Somebody said they got a very, very good value basket from Habitat for about £7.50. Well, if you go to places like, um, you know, Jerry's Home Store and stuff like that, they're always going to have whatever, you know, the, the knockoffs. Right, we've got a picture of Anna Friel. Oh, with a great big sort of beach-looking affair. Well, I think we, we thought. Well, I think we thought this was the closest we had, and that would be kind of cool for the beach, wouldn't it? Yes, lovely. But she's obviously not on the beach. Is it all right to <laughs> tote one of those round in town? I think as long as you you're enjoying the look, does it matter? So no. that was in Miss Selfridge bag. Miss Selfridge, only twelve pounds, ladies. Good one. Nice so that's one. That's quite a good one. React. Do we like this? <laughs> React. Look at the, the front Italians. Line aren't looking, <laughs> the front no. line aren't looking very hopeful. Okay, next one. Well, who have we got next? This is Paula Yates. Let's see what handbag she's carrying. Also a great big thing. Isn't it? Well, I think that's probably. I mean, the Lulu Guinness is pretty special, but that's expensive at 95, I think. 95. But I but think pretty. you know, you, we can pretty much look. That's a little warehouse one. I mean, that's only 17. That's kind of cute, isn't it? Yes, very sweet. But so I can do the basket look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've got to we've got to ha make these four happy in the front. Yeah, in the front. They're, they're very, very miserable in the front. Row. Now and we've there's got little Debenhams. That's kind of cute. That's little, very pretty. That's sort of 1950s, isn't it? I think there's definitely going to be a swing to the 50s. Now we've got your friend Tara Palmer Tompkinson, and what is she carrying there? I would guess that that's a Sonia Heskel, which is quite expensive. But, you see, if you're smart, like, like I am, <laughs> you can get one of these. And I found this at a, a little thrift store, and it cost me a tenner. And it's very, very pretty. And that's a bit more chic. And nobody else has it. Yes, which is... So I think thrift store, you know, and uh, going to sort of car boot sales and stuff like that is definitely the way to go uh, so for individuality. I. OK. And I've got Cameron Diaz. Let's see. Ah. Oh. Now, we've got a close-up on this. This is a very pretty beaded bag. We have managed to get this. <laughs> Tell this us about... I can't enjoy. tell you how difficult it was to get this. Tell us what this even is. This is a Fendi baguette bag. And this little number will set you back 600 and... What is it? 29 pounds. And that is the cheapest in the range. They actually go up to about 3,000. Now, just in case you think you're going to rush out and buy one of these today at which 629 pounds, which we don't think, but just imagine you did, you can't, because there There's is a, a waiting, waiting list <laughs> for this Fendi baguette bag, and it is a waiting list with 400 people on it. So if you want to sign up, that's what you've got to do. But, I mean, it's very chic. Mm. It's, I, mean, would I think you, you'd be better you, off to... But to seriously, find, would you spend that? Would you buy it? I, I don't buy expensive handbags. I think they're a bit of a rip-off. But, you know, I'm not meant to say things like that. So, I prefer... I mean, I think um, the shop accessorise, which we've got a little ethnic bag. Yeah. They have great knockoffs, you know, and I think you're, you know, you might as well use that. Yeah, okay. exactly. Next one, Jodie Foster. Oh, look, that's pretty. It looks oh, like a bag to match those. her look. dress. We've got virtually identical bag here. But we don't think this is probably the one she has. <laughs> But, it's but this is, yeah, this is just a little, this is very popular, but, I mean, if you're the sort of girl who carries tons of stuff, you're not going to be really that keen on this one, but that's from Accessorise, the shop that I was just talking about. Yes, yeah, And that's only 17, so that's not... Now, just show us how to wear these. These are the, this urban look. This, for example, is called the apron bag. This is a very special... I'm not mad about this, I have to say, it looks like a bum bag. And I mean, I don't know, most girls do not wish to illuminate their belly area, so I'm not sure who's, who's going to wear it. Try this, because this is apparently all the rage, this one. Would you wear this? This is apparently this the is... last one. This is from Whistles I mean, at £39. Guys, what, pounds. What's up with that? I, what do you think? Would you wear that? I think it's fine if you're sort of like a courier or something. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to say any of this, am I? I'm going to be telling you how chic it is. I'm not sh I think that's kind of... I think maybe great well, for Well, the students. urban gorilla look is not you. You're the small beaded look, aren't you? Well, Let's I'm the small beaded... But look at yeah. this one. I mean, this one... Look we're not that. even quite sure what you do. You put it on... This is... I'm just not sure how you get money out quickly if you're in a, you know, a tax... Well, maybe that's a good thing. Look, then you tie it on, I mean... Do we want one of those? No! Thank you very much, Tamara. I'm not Brilliant going for to that see one. You. That's about it for today. Join me on Monday for Mr Rubberface himself, Phil Cool, live. The First Lady of Football, Karen Brady, talks about life as one of the boys of Birmingham City, why more women than ever before are turning to drink, and top tips on making the best, best man speech. Now it's time to welcome this week's winner of A Star Is Born, Julie Wells, singing us out with All Around the World. See you on Monday. Lots of love. Bye-bye. I don't know my babies. But I'll find him somewhere, somehow. I never give up looking for my baby. Been around the world and I, 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 I can't find my baby. I don't know and I don't know why. Why he's gone away and I don't know where he can be. My baby. But I'm gonna find him mm, We had a quarrel And I let myself go And I said things Things
things he didn't know And I was oh so bad And I don't think he's coming back I don't think he's coming back 